Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DATIQ weekly market update. This is our first update for spring. It's March 21st, 2023. I'm Ken Animo, Chief of Analytics at DAT. I'm joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst, and very special guest. We have Todd Amon back, um, who's President of uh, America Truck Business Services. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Yeah, <clears throat> Dean pointed out I'm rocking the short sleeves. I'm going to grill out tonight. I'm, I'm looking forward to it before we get snow in the later <laughs> half of this week. Right. Yeah. yeah, they said uh, on the Weather Channel that uh, March starts like a lion and ends like a lamb, uh, which kind of sums up the the weather that we're seeing at the moment. Still, there's a lot of snowstorms out west and a lot of rain, so it's um, the further east you go, things are pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm used to Ohio, which is probably the most frenetic weather in just about anywhere, right? We'll have at least five or six more seasons before we actually get to spring, I would suspect. <laughs> It, it's right. just the snow just melted a couple of days ago. So, yeah. Yeah. what are you going to do? How are you, Todd? Yep. I'm doing good. You know, I'm in Colorado, so snow is uh, is welcome here because we can make good use of it, and and we're still getting it. It's going to get a lot this week in the mountains. Yeah, I'll be out in Denver Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So, hopefully, it's a little bit warm. I don't have to bring the the heavy winter clothes like I did last time. You might you might want to double check. You never know. Yeah. So, Todd, uh, I know you're a frequent guest of the show, but do you mind giving uh, new viewers a quick update on, or uh, I should say a quick summary of what ATPS does and your role and sort of some of the history there? Yeah, can you bet. Um, so, ATBS has been around 25 years. We work with independent contractors, uh, around 20,000 of them. We do their books and their taxes, and we consult with them in their business to help them understand kind of what's happening in the truck market and how they can be more successful as well as pay the least amount in taxes. So the fun thing about that is we have just an incredible amount of data that we use to help benchmark and understand everything about their business. And um, I'm the president, CEO of ATBS, started the business. And so I get to spend a lot of time with large truck lines as well as independent contractors just talking trucking. and. Uh, it's a lot of fun, man. I always enjoy uh, your guys. Your guys' analytics are top notch. Some of the best in the business. And I remember a year ago we were having this conversation, and uh, you guys were kind of on the leading edge of calling the end of the, the good times. And I'm not sure everybody believed you, including me. But soon enough, there it came. So I'm hoping that you're here to tell us things have turned the other way, and and the tough times are over. Yeah, I'd love. Well, tough times are over for the management of U.S. Express. It seems like. Um, as they were just announced that they're being acquired by Knight Swift this morning. But um, yeah, we, we thank you for joining. I mean, again, uh, right back at you around da quality of data. Um, we lean on you guys heavily for um, sort of that full picture of what it's like to be a small, con you know, small fleet or an owner operator. Um, yeah. So we'll bring Todd back at the end of the show. We have a a pretty healthy discussion we're going to have, but go ahead and drop your questions in the in the chat below. Uh, I'm going to get right into the key points of the week so we can bring Todd back with a ton of time for discussion and questions. So stay tuned. Uh, so key trends this week, we've got flatbed um, continuing to outperform, I think, even what we expected. Um, and then van and reefer probably underperforming what we had expected. Uh, well within the range of that forecast that we've been discussing over the last couple of weeks, just more on the pessimistic side, I would say. Uh, truckload demand indicators flat, um, and that's pretty much across all of the major uh, reporting agencies. You'll see CAS, Michigan State, uh, DAT, et cetera, all basically showing flat volumes. Single family housing starts up 1% month over month, permits up 8%. There's a weird phenomenon, right, when the interest rates are really, really high for some reason. I don't know particularly why. Maybe someone can chime in and tell us why. Um, new, ha new home construction is more advantageous than buying um, existing properties like i guess you'd say used houses i don't know what the right term is for that but resales um and then february teu imports are down 16 percent month over month lowest level since may of 20 almost a million fewer uh, so with that we're going to go over to dean for the detailed market update dean yeah thanks ken uh, we'll do a quick market update today uh, given we've got todd on we want to get to a lot of the discussion sooner today. So the long form version of today's market update will be published this evening at dat.com forward slash market update. So let's start with our load to truck ratio and drive and load posts reversed the downward trend of the prior two weeks up 4% last week capacity loosened uh, for the third week, though, 
Um, load, equipment post levels are about identical to this time last year. Load to truck ratio up slightly from 2.03 to 2.09. Uh, refrigerated volumes in the spot market cooled off again last week, down about uh, 1%, not a big drop, but they're about half what they were this time last year. Of course, the slow start to the produce season uh, in crucial growing regions is having a lot to do with that. Uh, total produce truckload volumes for those that track the market down about 11% year over year. That's the weekly loadings reported by the USDA. Tracking closely to produce levels around 2017, load to truck ratio was flat last week at 3.15. And in flatbed, uh, flatbed volumes recorded their highest level this year, their highest weekly level of load posts last week. Uh, up 2%. Uh, of course, temperatures are warming. We've had a much warmer winter here in the northeast and east coast. Uh, spring started yesterday, so volumes are up about 32% in the last month. Equipment posts remained unchanged. Load to truck ratio up slightly to 16.34. We'll have a look at a couple of main markets today. In our top 10 markets, uh, they accounted for about 26% of our volume last week, so that's 10, the top 10 markets out of 135. Uh, Atlanta was still the number one market last week for dry van, volumes up 4%. Capacity was flat, though. The average uh, dry van outbound rate per mile was $1.67. Remember, these are line haul rates excluding fuel. Having a look at the Georgia state level rates, they're about $1.70 per mile, $0.04 cents per mile higher than 2019. It's an important data point there as we get through the show. Some high volume lanes, though, out of Atlanta. One of the busier ones is Lakeland, Florida. Volumes were up 8% last week but recorded the lowest spot rate in 12 months at $2.48. Atlanta to Miami, 8% lower last week on volume. Rates also hit a new 12-month low at $2.13. Uh, Houston was the number two spot market in the country. Volumes are up 23%, and uh, opposite to Atlanta, um, spot rates are up $0.03 cents a mile to $1.73. State level rates in Texas for dry vans at $1.69 excluding fuel are identical to dry van rates in 2018. Quick look at uh, refrigerated market in produce. Uh, the USDA reported last week of the 20 reporting districts and regions, only two reported a slight shortage of trucks. Uh, that was Central Florida for winter vegetables and Eastern North Carolina for sweet potatoes. That's in the Raleigh freight market. Uh, four regions reported a slight surplus of trucks, Nogales, Kern, Oxnard, and Santa Maria. So three of the markets reporting a surplus of trucks were in California. Uh, two districts reported uh, a, a bigger surplus, McAllen and uh, for imports from Mexico and southern Texas and the Yakima Valley in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, we're watching the significant rains unfold in California. There's no question that will delay uh, the planting season for produce. That could, uh, we, we sort of predicting that will delay the shipment volumes coming out of the West Coast as we work our way towards the middle of summer. Having a look at the flatbed market, uh, some good news uh, emerged last week, as Ken mentioned, permits up. They're a good at leading indicator of flatbed volume for future construction. Uh, home starts uh, most at the most uh, freight intensive for flatbed carriers. 61% of those new starts are built in the southeast. When we had a look at our southeast volumes last week, uh, volumes are up 3% in the spot market. Solid gains reported in Jackson, Mississippi. Volumes up 13%. Outbound spot rates up $0.07 cents a mile to $2.60. In neighbouring Montgomery, flatbed capacity was very tight. On slightly lower volumes, rates jumped $0.42 cents a mile to $2.90 for outbound loads. And wrapping up with our year-over-year -year look at spot rates, uh, dry van continued to lose ground last week, down by just under one cent per mile to $1.72. Uh, tracking, as you can see from the, the graph, check tracking very close with 2019 levels directionally. They were 12 cents per mile higher than that year, um, last week ending Saturday. Based on the volume of loads moved, the average rate for DAT's top 50 dry van lanes was 20 cents a mile higher than the national average at $1.92. Uh, having a look at our top 100 lanes, line haul rates decreased on 68% of the lanes, only increased on 11% with the balance remaining neutral. Uh, in refrigerated, at $2.02 .02 per mile, the national average line haul rate is identical to levels reported in 2020, which of course is just two weeks before demand crashed, resulting from the pandemic outbreak. Uh, spot rates are just over uh, one cent a mile last week down. Uh, on our top 70 reefer lanes, 60% um, of those reported lower volumes or lower rates last week, excuse me. And wrapping up with flatbed, uh, spot rates continue to increase following last week's $0.03 cent per mile gain. National average for flatbed is at $2.19. Uh, rates have increased $0.07 cents a mile in the last month and are just $0.03 cents per mile lower than this time in 2018. So that's it for this week's market update. Over to Ken for the short-term forecast. 
Thank you much, Dean. Um, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to comply with Todd's request for some positive news today, at least not in the ultra short term. Um, but I'll do my best to explain what we're seeing. So uh, for those uh, that are familiar, you'll be kind of accustomed to this chart. But for those new, we have a uh, van, dry van, what we're starting out with. This is our short term 35 day forecast. The blue line is the historical moving seven day weighted moving average going back to October. And then we have four forecast models. We have green, which is rate cast. That's the one you see in all of our products. The red is the short term model. That's going to more heavily uh, be weighted to near term data. And then you have the gray and the yellow, which are uh, sort of intermediate blends of those models. And when you look at the dry van forecast, I'm really kind of quite surprised that while they disagree a bit, all four models are pretty much um, pushing against a very strong seasonal pattern that we should be experiencing as we get into early April. Um, you can see maybe some upticks in the last couple of days of the forecast, but nothing material. It'll be really important to watch this over the next couple of weeks to see um, if we start to get any optimism coming into the spring. Um, you know, we've been saying for a few weeks now, a few months now, if we get into late April, even in early May without a material uptick, we could be bracing for a really poor year in the trucking um, sector, especially for dry van and reefer. Let's move on to reefer. Uh, again, more tight alignment here, I guess, at least over the next, I don't know, 15 to 25 days. Then you start to see a bit of a difference. The short-term model, surprisingly, is showing a little more strength towards the end of the forecast horizon, whereas rate cast isn't as optimistic and bottoms out there. Uh, what is that around a dollar eighty-five a mile pre-fuel for long haul, um, heading into the middle of April? Let's finish with some good news. Uh, so this one's interesting. Um, this is flatbed. Uh, the short-term model is up and to the right. It, it, it's it's reckless optimism there, if you will. Uh, green, again, being rate cast, has it being in pretty much alignment until the end of this month into the very early part of April, and then sort of regressing back. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting time period. Um, if you look at the data that Dean showed in those year-over-year -year rates, uh, there was a, a point where the year sort of forked, and it could have went more towards 18 or more towards 19. Um It'll be really interesting to see if we this this spring boost continues us into the summer for flatbed, because pretty much the second um, two quarters of the year are going to be largely determined by what happens, kind of leading up to and immediately following the Fourth of July. So again, very important to watch the spring season in all three equipment types. But that's enough of the forecast. Let's bring Todd back and get to our question of the week. Uh, yes, Ken. So, Todd, question of the week is a bit of a layup, uh, but now that 2022 is in the books, what's the outlook for small carriers this year? Well, I think, uh, as you guys have been talking about, this is a challenging year. Um, we knew it was going to be, and, uh, you know, as we work with our drivers, as we talk to fleets, um, I think there's optimism for the back half of the year, and really that's probably just based on history difficult truck markets typically happen fairly quick and fairly deep. And, and we've had almost a year of that already. And, you know, in, in the worst case, it's typically 18 months. And so I think you're assuming by the third quarter, things are going to get a bit better, but we got, we got more pain before we got good. That's for sure. It's going to be a, another tough few months. Yeah. Um, Todd, some of the data points you produced from your benchmarking um, series of webinars in the last couple of uh, well, last couple of months, I guess, um, big surprise to me was miles were down about eleven percent year over year, and even lower than twenty eighteen. What's your take on that? You know, Dean, it's a bit of a, a mystery for us at the moment. Um, what we always see going back through 25 years of data is that drivers run less miles when times are good. And so mm. through COVID, there was a large drop in productivity. There's higher paying freight. So people get more choosy. They take more time off, you know, they're making more money. And so they want to, mm. you know, enjoy the fruits of that. When we see things get difficult, typically within three to four months, when income goes down, drivers run more miles because that's the only way to run, make more money really is right. add more productivity. And, I mean, we are seeing our miles at 11% lower um, than they were a year ago. And usually by probably, I'd even say last summer, we'd have seen miles pick up and we have seen no change in miles almost a year later. We're still running record low miles. And 
so it's just it's interesting there's a lot of reasons for it um mm -hmm. we all talk about you know there's the regionalization of freight there's highway congestion but i think there's a lot of new things um mm -hmm. there's shipper delays especially for the small fleet small owner operator that doesn't have drop and hook like a big fleet you know mm -hmm. the shippers and the receivers don't have loading and unloading capability and capacity because they're short of labor and so there's a lot of delays as far as those things go there's maintenance delays because people don't have labor to fix trucks and so all those things combined i think are adding into just record low miles which is really interesting yeah i mean i think it's we talk a lot um especially in our own internal forecasting around like the p and the q right so it's not just carriers right brokers right now are very concerned with that equation right so they're they're probably making more per load from a you know margin percentage, but they're moving less loads. So like, they need to reconfigure their businesses much in the way that truck drivers need to reconfigure their businesses to accommodate shifting prices and quantities. Yeah, I, you know one of the most interesting things about low miles is if you if you quantify that, you know, eleven percent less miles, or it's down twenty percent since twenty eighteen. That's like taking if let's just say there's 300,000 owner operators. That's like taking 60,000 trucks off the road, really running 20% less miles. So when trucks start running more miles, it's going to add capacity, which could put more pressure on rates. Um, and that's happening on the company side as well as the owner operator side. So that could be at an interesting dynamic as we go through the year. Todd, um, some of the large truck that carries we talked to in our network reported that they had, um, the, the statement was drivers have never made as much money and they never want to be at home as much. So our, our seated truck availability number is pretty high. It's high. You know, it's not that we can't find drivers. It's that we can't get enough drivers behind the wheel based on our available driving, you know, capacity pool. Do you think that's part of it when you get down to the smaller fleets? Yeah, I think it's, it's a huge part of it. And right. as we debate it, you know, and as I've, been, I've talked to a lot of the large truck lines that I've been out with the last couple of months, right. truck drivers are no different than the rest of us. I mean, America changed its work ethic during the pandemic and mm -hmm. work-life balance swayed much more towards life than work. Right. Right. And truck drivers are no different. They just want to um, take some time off and enjoy the fruits of their labor. So right. um, I think that's what they're doing. And, and it's, you know, with record low unemployment, it's hard to right. get anybody to put in more than a 40 hour week right. and it's hard to get people right. to go to the office, you know, yeah. so why are truck drivers? Yeah. Really, you don't say. Yeah. <laughs> it's the life we're Tell living. me more. Tell me more about this phenomenon we're all experiencing. <sighs> Todd, um, I never thought about point... truck drivers, right? Oh, That's an, it's yeah. an interesting, something really interesting that I hadn't thought about, but yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real phenomenon with the large TLs for sure. So, um, Todd, uh, I remember this time a year ago, maybe it was, uh, I can't remember which year, but average net income was about seventy thousand dollars. I think that was twenty twenty one, which was and if I, I'll paraphrase. I think your statement. I think you said it was the highest in three decades, or, or something to that effect. Um, where did operator income end up last year? Then, given that miles were lower. Yeah, we peaked in the pandemic at seventy two thousand dollars average right. for right. all. You know, that's twenty thousand drivers. Um, last year it was 64,500 so it's down pretty significantly mm. and and that's really why i say it's a bit of a mystery that miles haven't picked up because typically when you know people build their lifestyle around that higher earning pretty quickly as they make more money they go you know borrow things and buy things and right. so it's surprising that the miles haven't picked up to try and offset that decrease in in that income because it's down 10 percent from what it was a year ago mm. yeah um the other the other big thing of course has changed in the last year is the skyrocketing diesel prices right so we're sort of lapping the the year over year change in diesel prices when russia invaded the ukraine i think they peaked in june around five dollars eighty to a gallon uh down a long way since then but in the 22 two numbers how big an impact did the diesel costs uh skyrocketing have an impact on profitability you know, it was a big piece of it. And and you guys were, you know, really among the first to say last year, it was really strange to see spot rates coming down while diesel was going up. That just doesn't really happen, right? We have to keep right. rates up to offset increased fuel prices. Right. And that's just was a crazy time in the market. And so those increased 
fuel costs hurt drivers, their costs were up 50%. And, and, you know, the market has to make up. I mean, there's a pretty good fuel surcharge formula that works in contract mm -hmm. freight. And ultimately mm -hmm. that feeds down into the small carriers. Right. The, the challenge is when it happens so quickly and you see that steep rise, there's a big cash flow lag because shippers pay, you know, bills mm -hmm. 30 to 45 days later and the pump price adjusts right. every single day. And, right. and so you saw a lot of those small carriers and owner operators having to factor bills and they were desperate for cash. In fact, they parked their trucks. I've never seen them before. They just parked their <laughs> trucks for three right. months last year when yeah. fuel was spiking because they couldn't afford to fill the tanks and mm -hmm. really something I've never seen before. But it's leveled off and it's come down a bit, which is good. Mm -hmm. At least I think it's kind of stabilized with market rates at the moment, but it, it hurt last year for sure. Yeah. Ken's quiet. Can you hear Ken, Todd? Oh, Ken's muted. While Ken's doing that, um, we saw uh, in our business and some of the FMCSA data on DOT carrier authorizations and exits, there was a massive exit at, I'd say massive, I can quantify it, but there was a significant exit in May, June last year, which may be the cash flow lag you're just talking about. And then we saw another surge of carriers leave the industry in October, November. Um, but certainly October, November would have been right after the peak in diesel prices early March and then the cash flow lag that you're talking about. So that did have a big impact. Do you think one of the things we saw was carriers were saying, you know, first of all, what's a fuel surcharge, which was an interesting discussion because uh, a lot of guys that were new to the industry hadn't really caught up on the fact there was a fuel recapture program on the contract side of the market because they'd only just been working on broker freight that was sort of an all-in rate. And I think that uh, anecdotally, I saw a lot of carriers start to rethink about <clears throat> how they price their freight because when you're dropping 1500 bucks in two tanks every few days, it really gets your attention. Unlike, you know, when diesel's sort of in that low, you know, high, high $2 range. So uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think people don't necessarily care about fuel under $3 a gallon. But another mm -hmm. really interesting thing in our recent data is that fuel economy has not improved at all. So again, when fuel spikes, people mm -hmm. slow down, they idle less, they do things right. to manage their fuel. Right. And we've right. seen zero change in fuel economy. So it's like we got used to these uh -huh. habits that we developed during COVID of running mm -hmm. fast to get to the next high paying load and then taking time off. And mm -hmm. it's 180 degrees different today. I mean, the operating model mm -hmm. has to change drastically to mm -hmm. be successful. And we just mm -hmm. haven't, no, no matter how much we talk about it and, you know, try and help our drivers understand they haven't changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, you got to slow down and you got to run more miles. That's that's right. like right. counterintuitive, but at the end of the right. day, that's right. the only way you're going to make more money in this market. More, yeah, more miles in each hour. That's yeah. the kit. So hopefully you can hear me now. Sorry about that. I had a we can. technical difficulty. Can you hear me? Got yep. All right, good. Yep. So Todd, the question I was going to ask that was kind of like the silent film era was the impact of these high interest rates on small fleets and owner operators. You know, I guess I would equate that to truck price for our drivers because that's really kind of their fixed asset. Um, factoring rates, I guess, probably go up a bit when interest rates rise. Um, but more than anything, it's the the asset that they have debt on. And and we have not seen our truck prices increase drastically. It's around $2,700. We really started to see them kind of creep up in November and December of last year. I think a lot of our clients, because they're owner operators, they run used trucks for a long time. And when asset prices doubled during the pandemic, they were smart enough to not go out and buy a bunch of those because they knew they were overpriced. So I think that interest rate probably, we haven't seen the effect on owner operators until they start refinancing and buying trucks that are worn out over the next mm. you know, coming year or two. I think it hasn't really hit the owner operator population yet. Speaking of factoring, probably the last question I have, any concerns among your customer base around access to liquidity for factoring, um, given the SVB and kind of potential global banking calamity? I think at the moment, you know, there's a lot of good factoring companies out there that do a good job for owner operators and access to cash is really important right now. And, and so I think a lot of drivers have just accepted that as a cost of doing business. And um, yeah, banking is a scary place right now, I guess, uh, you know, for owner operators, they don't have a lot in the bank. The money goes to the factor, they get the bill and they put it in the tank to run more miles, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, they don't have to worry about their their 
uh, more than $250,000 not being available at, at their local bank. Um, yeah, so Todd, one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot is um, the amount of capacity that's shifted, you know, this capacity migration that goes on when rates go up and down. You have a really good benchmarking uh, chart where you talk about the cost to run your own authority. I think you peg it at about 48 cents a mile. Uh, can you, and, I, and it looks like that inflection point sort of we crossed that line middle of last year, thereabouts in May, where it become more profitable will be leased on. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit about that transition and what might trigger a transition back the other direction? Because I don't think we'll see record high spot rates like we did in the last 18 months that might facilitate that massive surge towards independent contractors that we've seen. Yeah, Dean. So it is 50 cents a mile, roughly about $50,000. Right. If I'm going to go, you know, get my own authority and run the spot market versus being leased onto a motor carrier, that differential peaked during COVID at about a buck 35, a mm. huge margin, which literally allowed drivers to double their net income. They could go from making 70,000 to 125, 130,000. And last May, pretty quick, within a couple yeah. of months of the, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, it plummeted below the break even and it bottomed out in November at about 12 cents. Right now mm -hmm. it sits at like 30 cents. And so really what that tells you is just on a straight up, you know, comparison, I can run for a fleet today and make $65,000. If I'm running under my own authority, I'm going to make forty-five to 50000 I'm going to lose $20,000 doing right. that. So there's a big right. migration of those drivers wanting to go back to fleets that have those higher longer term contracted rates. Yep. I think we saw, I, I saw an OIDA quote a few weeks ago that said for the first time in their history, their membership had more drivers that had their own authority mm -hmm. than they did operating for motor carriers. Mm -hmm. So I think we had a big migration. I know we did, you know, 100,000 mm -hmm. drivers went into the right. spot market during COVID. Now they're on their way back to either getting out of business, becoming company drivers, or going to work for motor carriers um, under their authority. For sure, there's a big shift. Yeah, the uh, when we look at the amount of exits and entry entrance into the market at the DAT level, it's, it's been flatlining at about 2,000 carriers a month, sort of net loss in the interstate category. So we're certainly losing capacity, but it's the rate of uh, decrease is sort of slowed down and bottoming out and showing signs of coming back up. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that play into that. Fuel costs have got to come down more and, and rates have got to go up to make it more attractive. But there's definitely a sense that uh, we've, you know, the amount of carriers leaving the industry is sort of plateaued at the moment, even though the net each month is still a, still a recording a loss. So there are ways to go before we start to see people come back to the market um, to get above that 50 cents a mile that you were talking about where independent contractor status becomes sort of more viable. Uh, one, just a follow-up question on that. Sorry, Ken. No, I have a question to end the show on. Yeah, so I, I just had a, one of the questions we've uh, been sort of posing and it's based on our feedback from some owner-operators. Depending on how new you were to the industry and how much you paid for a used truck in the last two years, that really determined um, how high your operating costs were. So again, on the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of carriers that own their own equipment and don't have finance costs and can park their truck for three months. Um, they could run theoretically for a much lower rate per mile and get by. Um, others that have a lot more uh, debt and higher insurance costs need a lot more. Um, do you see that in your business? There's this sort of bell curve distribution of operating costs per mile from a, a you know a, a tenured experienced owner operator to someone that's brand new. Yeah, I think for sure, Dean. Our average operating cost per mile, and this is with no pay to the driver. This is just to run the truck. Was a buck fifty last right. year. That was up thirty five cents a mile from the year before. But if I went out and bought a hundred and twenty thousand dollar used truck instead of a sixty thousand dollar used truck, yeah, my my costs are going to be 15, 20 cents higher. So I'm yeah. going to need more like a buck 65. But then you had a bunch of drivers that had paid off trucks. They got right. PPP money. They got, mm -hmm. you know, government stimulus checks during COVID. And so for the first time, really, you saw drivers just sitting out um, yeah. a terrible market last year or selling their truck because they had money in their asset and they could make yeah. money and go do something else. So it's, yeah. it's a different change than typical. There's not the bankruptcies that we've had in the past. Right. It's people just getting out of the business for the, for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So topically, <laughs> since we've got a copious amount of freight experience on this show, as I alluded to at the beginning of the show, Night Swift is buying us express. Todd, what are your thoughts? 
Well, Ken, you shocked me with that uh, news this morning. They're both partner carriers of ours. We work with their owner operators. Um, I've, I've worked with Knight Swift for 20 years and I know them really, really well. And they know how to run truck lines really well. They know how to price um, freight. And, uh, you know, I like the folks at US Express a lot, but it's been an underperforming stock, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So I think Knight and Swift will um, bring pricing discipline and market discipline to operating that truck line where there's some assets and some drivers. And I think at the end of the day, um, it'll make really good capacity to continue all freight and trucking really, really an interesting move. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, strictly speaking from the reasons why my two finance degrees are completely and totally worthless, um, even though they're not that old is I, I never would have contemplated a world where you pay $6 a share for an asset that's losing 86 cents a share. Um, and a lot of the underlying fundamentals. But look, I think when you dig into it, that's the initial reaction. But I was really digging into some of the balance sheet and income statement this morning. And they've got a lot of really great assets on the books that I th you're right. I think if Knight mm -hmm. Swift believes um, that they can they can they can flip that negative to a positive mm -hmm. with those assets, it makes total mm -hmm. sense. Right. They bought Knight bought Swift, right, to become the largest yep. North American truck load carrier a while yep. back. Yeah. If you go back through history, um, Swift had a track record of buying really low valued, almost bankrupt carriers. And then Knight kind of got into the business of buying good carriers and making them better, but letting them mm -hmm. run autonomously. They did that with bar none. They've done it with some other, some other truck lines, refrigerated truck lines. And so the two together have just a really powerful management team mm -hmm. and process and yep. systems. And yep. they bring just great discipline to running a truck line. And I, I bet that they've laid those numbers Maybe just even pricing. I mean, they're good at pricing freight. Mm -hmm. They understand the yeah. market really well. I was with them two weeks ago and we actually talked about the DAT data and they said, we love DAT's data. It gives us a lot of clarity into the market. And mm -hmm. so I think maybe some of that will, you know, happen now at, at USX. Yeah. I mean, we have great relationships um, across the industry, so I'm, I'm optimistic and it'll be interesting. I, my money, if I was a, I'm not a big gambler. So I say this all the time on the show. If I was a gambler, my, my bet would have been on us express taking itself private, which I think would have been the second time in the last 20 years that would have happened. But, mm. um, it looks like they had a willing suitor and, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of David Jackson and Kevin Knight's management style. I've put, put my money on those guys. They've done pretty good things with, uh, the turnaround at Swift. So I think that, uh, that will flow over to this acquisition pretty quickly. Yeah. Should be interesting to see if we, you know, more consolidation would be interesting. These mm -hmm. low periods is when you typically see a lot of consolidation because things are cheap. Right. Right. Um, and if you have, if you're a well-run company with capital to deploy, you've got to deploy it somewhere. Yeah, um, the, that was the interesting thing is, you know, together what all those companies will do less than, I don't know, 10 billion in revenue, I think. And um, we're in a trillion dollar logistics market. So even the mega monsters are still, Right. a fairly small piece of the overall picture but mm -hmm. but people that know how to price um running trucks is important in a market mm -hmm. like this people that underprice hurt the whole industry and right. um mm -hmm. knight and swift are really good at pricing freight yeah, yeah. they seem really good much like warner with operating as well right and yeah. when you look at some of the average miles driven per power unit with us express it was pretty dismal compared to mm -hmm. some of the fleets like warner and knight yeah. swift and like some of the more regionals like heartland and and, and fleets like that. I mean, oh, you used yeah. to quote this team. I mean, U.S. Express was only running how many miles per tractor per week? Yeah, the the variant number was fifteen forty eight per week was the average for that last quarter of last year, which is you know way too low from a driver's perspective in terms of making a decent wage. But one thousand five hundred and forty eight is on the low end, I would think. Yeah. All right, so we got some plugs. Yeah, uh, as always, tomorrow, sales chat is on 11 a.m. Eastern with Ryan Mohammed and Jeff Dickinson. Uh, we're on Landline Now, 7 p.m. on Sirius XM, uh, Channel 146, Road Dog Radio. R Robert Rouse is on tomorrow night. I'm on with Jimmy Mack, 8 a.m. on Thursday morning, talking trucking. Don't forget, next week is the Mid-America Truck Show. Uh, DAT has a booth, so does Todd and the ATBS team. Uh, the big concerts on Friday night. LB Shane is the uh, headliner. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the tickets. There's 15,000 free tickets to give away. Uh, you can only get those tickets at our booth, booth 65216. Capital, uh, TIA Capital Ideas is on April 19th through 22. 
uh, in Florida. A couple of other dates you want to keep uh, in mind. The Vidalia Onion Pack date has been announced for 4-19, April 19. That's the official start of the produce season, for those that don't know. And the Road Check Week has been slated for the week of May the 19th. Um, so just remember you can find out more about what's happening in freight. Go to dat.com forward slash market update and download the long form version of today's market update. Uh, be published this evening. Uh, Todd, if uh, we have a ton of uh, owner operators that listen to the show, how can they get in touch with you if they aren't already? It's really easy. ATBS.com or 888-640-4829. We'd love to talk to them and help them out with their business. Awesome. So we'd love to have you back on next quarter, um, go over some of the trends, and hopefully we're starting to see some more green green shoots, much like spring. Hopefully we'll start to see some um, some some lush green areas in the freight market, but um, we know that we'll always keep it rooted in data when we have you on the show. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, yeah it's fun. always fun to be with you guys, Dean and Ken. Great to see you. Yeah. All right, great to see you. All right, so everyone have a great week. Have a safe week. We know there's still some weather kind of coast to coast. Um, hopefully you guys are gearing up for a strong uh, spring shipping season. And we will talk yep. to you next week at 10 a.m. Eastern. Bye, everyone. Bye.